Uh, thanks so much for attending. This is Moving Your Class Online. And there are three objectives uh, to today's webinar. The first objective is to identify best practice practices for remote instruction. The second objective objective is to discuss how to modify face-to-face -face content for remote learning. The third objective is to try to identify some great tools to provide great remote instruction. So I'm going to take a moment here to pause and ask if any of you are comfortable or have provided online instruction. And maybe you can just comment in the chat room. I'd like to get a feel for where we're at. So we've got a couple of no's, Google Classroom, no Zoom instruction yet, have never done this working on it. Yes, not yet. No so we've got a lot of people who are really new to providing remote instruction, it looks like. Well, that's good because that's kind of what I was anticipating. I'd like to let you all know that everything I'm going to go over in this webinar today is available in a Padlet. And I'm going to ask, um, I think what I'm going to do is send the Padlet link to Melinda, and then hopefully she can put it in the chat box and you can copy and paste the link somewhere so that you can explore these, so that you can explore these materials a little bit further on your own. Okay, so um, don't worry about taking incredible notes because all of these materials are available on this Padlet, which hopefully Melinda can get linked into the chat box. Let's begin with, first of all, identifying what remote instruction is. I'm gonna start the video. Melinda, will you let me know if you hear my computer audio? Sure. And no. So you need to stop sharing. Okay. Um, click the share button again, and there should be a little checkbox at the bottom left hand corner. Share computer sound. I see it. Perfect. Okay. Let's go back to the beginning, and hopefully, you can hear it. Temporary remote teaching and learning. Can you hear it? There are yes. three general types of instruction in our system. On the one end of the spectrum is face-to-face -face teaching and learning, in which all instructor-to-student and student-to-student -student contact occurs face-to-face. -face. On the other end of the spectrum is online teaching and learning. These are courses in which all instructor-to-student and student-to-student -student interactions occur fully online. Hybrid teaching and learning, which can include blended courses, is where teaching and learning occur partially face-to-face and partly online. And now we're introducing temporary remote teaching and learning, which allows for learning to continue when unexpected emergency situations like the coronavirus occur. Let's consider a scenario for a moment. Let's say you're teaching a 16-week face-to-face course and you learn that you'll need to transition your course to remote instruction beginning with week 11. Your first step is to assess the situation. In this scenario, you'll have six weeks left to complete your course. Your second step is to identify what's remaining in the course, what topics, assignments, and assessments are left for students to complete. Then move on to step three, create a module in Canvas for each remaining week and organize your course content using pages, assignments, and quizzes. Step four is where you may schedule Tech Connect confer Zoom sessions during your regularly scheduled course times to deliver live lecture-based content and to interact with students. These four steps, along with a little planning, give you a solid foundation for creating instructional continuity for your students during an emergency when regular face-to-face -face classroom meetings have been interrupted. 
Despite the feeling of urgency, both you and your students will benefit if you take the time to stop, think, and plan. Okay, so if you ignore the canvas part of that, I think it's very good advice. Um, let's begin with best practice one for remote learning. Best practice one is that remote learning is very structured and organized. It's important to remember that many of your students will be as new as you are to remote learning. This means they will not only be learning the content that you provide, they will be learning how to navigate through their new online room. The more structured and organized your content is, the easier it will be for students to follow it. Some ideas for organizing your content. Many, instruct, many instructors in my district are organizing their content by week. They may call it week one. Most of them are dating it, like the week of March 24th through the 28th. Other instructors are organizing their content by chapter, sort of following their textbook. I'm going to show you my online course. I'm currently teaching completely online, and I'm going to show you my online course organization content so you can get a feel for how you might want to organize your content. In every single module, like chapter, that's like a chapter of my course, there's a pattern. Students always click on an agenda first. And the agenda is sort of like the table of contents. It describes what is inside this chapter or module. It also describes how long each activity will take and how many points it's worth. I also feature a little video of me asking inviting questions so that students are sort of pulled into the content. Every single module or chapter begins with a reading and the intent of the reading is to introduce the vocabulary and grammar for the unit. Every single module contains a vocabulary practice where students get to practice the targeted vocabulary. Here you can see I'm just using Quizlet embedded. Every single module also features at least one grammar activity because I teach advanced online grammar. Every single module contains at least one writing feature because I want my students to use the grammar and vocabulary that we're using. And then every single module ends with independent practice, which is an opportunity for my students to practice the targeted grammar structure. Every single one of the modules follows that sort of organizational structure. Best practice, too, is that some of your learning will be synchronous and some will be asynchronous. As we're discovering, one of the most popular tools for synchronous learning is Zoom. Um, Melinda, you said they were cracking down on free accounts. The last I understood, you could create a free account and you can invite up to 100 participants, but you only get a 40 minute, uh, you only get a 40 minute meeting. You do get screen sharing and a whiteboard in case you want to write during your presentation, and you also get breakout groups. So Zoom is one way of providing synchronous instruction where you and your students meet online at the same time. Another tool that you can use for this is Skype. Skype is free. You can invite up to 50 people, and it does have a screen sharing feature. So it, in, in any of these modalities, with any of these tools, you could do screen sharing with a PowerPoint presentation or a Google slide. And then finally, we have Google Hangouts where you can invite up to 100 people. There's no time limitation with Skype or Hangouts, and you can screen share with all of these, and they're all free. So any of those tools would be really good for you to use with your students. 
And best practice number three, whenever possible, students should be able to interact with one another and with the content. So that means that when you migrate some of your face-to-face -to -face content to online, you might have to consider looking at it differently. Here's an example. This is an example of um, a student guide page from our number 28 EL Civics Objective, interacting with healthcare professionals and reading medicine labels. So here you see a face-to-face -face student guide where the student reads the content and then completes a matching activity. Well, how might I make that content a little more interactive for online instruction? For online instruction, you actually want your students interacting with the content. So here you see the very same medicine label, but what students do is click on the various numbers to see what each one of these features is about. Completing a matching, they will click on these numbers. See here, for example, they have to click on the number next to the doctor. This is not a correct response. This is not a correct response, but this is. So we're providing immediate feed as well as interactivity. And that's one thing that you might do. And by the way, this is called an interactive uh, PowerPoint slideshow. Here's another, whoops, let's go back to the slideshow here. Sorry, it keeps taking me back there. I think I linked it up badly. Okay, there we go. Here's another example. This is another uh, page of the student guide where students meeting face to face would practice with another student to complete this dialogue. Well, much of the time, your students are going to be online at different times. So, for you to try to provide times for them to meet to practice this dialogue isn't reasonable. So, what could you do? This is an example of an assignment created on a, on a tool called Linked, L-I-N-G-T. It's uh, linked to our Padlet, so you'll be able to find it. And here's how it looks. This is an assignment for very beginning level ESL students. And what the students do is they click on this blue button. <laughs> Hello, San Diego Family Clinic, Henry speaking. And to record their own vices, they click here. Hi, I need to see the doctor. Once they've completed all of these oral questions. What is the problem? My stomach hurts. Then the students click submit and the instructor will be able to listen to the responses and provide feedback. So once again, this is a tool called Linked, L-I-N-G-T. And it is great for oral assignments, not just ESL, but you're an e teacher and you just give a brief, um, a brief presentation, you could use that tool. And you can see how intuitive it is for students. There's not a lot of extra stuff there to point and click. So it makes it easy for them to figure out. Okay, so what are some possible tools you can use to actually host your online content? Well, if you're, if you're savvy and you want a whole suite of classroom possibilities, you want to look at a learning management system. All of the community college districts in California, I believe they're all on it now, use Canvas. That's what we use in our district. That's a really good learning management system. I believe you can create a free account and then you can create um, a class. I think then you'd have to physically invite students using their email accounts. Another possibility is Moodle, which is also free. 
Edmodo is also free, and I believe Edmodo looks more like Facebook. Canvas and Moodle both look similar. Edmodo looks a little bit different like Facebook. There's also um, a learning management system called Schoology. And if you're in the K through 12, it's possible that you are familiar with Google Classroom. All of these are great learning management systems and the benefits of using these learning management systems are that you have a full classroom suite at your disposal. You can grade things, you can create quizzes, you can create assignments, you can sometimes use outside apps, you can also um, usually email your students from right inside that learning management system. Now, some of the disadvantages are the steep learning curves involved. It takes a little, it takes a little time up front to be able to understand how to use these learning management systems, and they're, they're so full featured that there's a lot to learn. A middle of the road approach would be to host your content by creating a website. And there are lots of different tools for this. I personally use Google Sites, but I know that you can create one pretty quickly on Wix or Weebly as well. A word of caution about Weebly, Weebly is often blocked by school districts because of the amount of phishing that happens with, through their, through their uh, domain. So our district, a lot of our instructors created websites on Weebly that we can no longer use when we're at school because it blocks Weebly. So I would highly recommend maybe Google Sites or Wix. I'm going to show you an example of a Google site that I created for use with my advanced online grammar students. We are contributing to an international travel blog. So you can see my home page is World Travel Trips and Tips. Your home page might look something like Mrs. Johnson's ESL class or um, whatever class you're teaching, whatever ASE or ABE class you're teaching, you'd have on your title page. And you'll see over here, I have the names of countries. You might have week one, week two, or chapter one, chapter two. And students would click on a page and be taken there. So this is a international travel blog. She's from Haiti. She wrote about Haiti. You can see that on this site, you can have, um, you can have images, you can embed slide presentations. There's a lot of flexibility and most of these sites are fairly easy and intuitive to use. It's really click, drag, and drop. So I'm gonna pause for a moment just to see if there are any questions yet. No? Stephanie, this is Stephanie, this is Anthony, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Anthony. Hi, Stephanie. So um, a few slides ago, you were talking about interactive PowerPoints, and there, was, there were a couple of questions just about how you might get started to create these um, interactive PowerPoints. Oh, okay. That's a great question. And I can't tell you how many tutorial videos there are. And you can create interactive slideshows either in Google or in PowerPoint. You can use Google Slides or PowerPoint. And it's really just a matter of inserting links. That's what makes it interactive. Unfortunately, I can't really, um, I can't really like go deeply into that. That was actually a workshop that I gave at the Technology and Distance Learning Symposium recently. Maybe that could be a future webinar where we create interactive slideshows. They're really fun to use with students and they're very simple to do. It's really just a matter of placing things and linking them. Let's see if I can go back a few slides and show you what I mean. So maybe PowerPoint, for example, all I did was overlay a circle with an X in it. And then I created what's called a trigger animation in which when I click a particular thing, something pops up. That's all this is. It's just linking and creating animated slides. It's pretty easy to do, but it's really kind of its own, um, it's really kind of its own webinar, I think. Okay, so there's an example of Google Sites. It's pretty easy to use. You could use it with your students to post your content. 
But let's say that you're in a huge hurry. You don't have a lot of time up front to actually figure some of these tools out. Another great option, at least for the meanwhile, would be to host on Padlet. And Padlet is what I'm using to share all of our webinar resources with you today. And you can see that you can link anything up here. You can link, you can link um, video, you can link, you can link websites. So for example, if this was your course, you could have week one and then you could have all of the links. You can also upload files if you want your students working on those. You could have week two and you could have all of your links that you need and all of the files that your students need. Padlet is just an online bulletin board and it's easy to just click anywhere on the background to post. So that's something that you could use if you're in a huge hurry and you don't have a lot of time to invest in learning something like creating a website or a learning management system. Now let's move into some tools that you can use with your students to provide really good content. One of the best ways to introduce new content to your students is through video. This is a great way to provide lectures to students online. And you can find lots of content on YouTube. Uh, if you were an ABE or ASE teacher, some suggestions would be Khan Academy. There are so many different math and English videos there. You could use TED Talks. American Museum of Natural History. These are all channels on YouTube. And then, of course, TED Talks has its own website. The History Channel has great three-minute videos. You want to keep your videos short. You don't want to inundate your students with videos that are over 10 minutes. Ideally, they should be between 5 and 10 minutes. There's a site on YouTube called Data is Beautiful. I'm going to take you there. It's really, it's just um, a compilation of various data trends. Here's an example of a video. You can just see the population movement over time. This is a really fun site to just get people talking about trends. And you can see along the sidebar here, they have largest armies in the world. Um, 20 most populated cities. It's a Stephanie, really fun way to view data. Stephanie, uh -huh. I'm going to interject just a minute. Um, when you play your audio or your videos, could you crank your volume down just a little bit? Because oh, is it really loud? We, well, we can't hear you over the, um, the video. So just a little bit. Oh, I'll more. tell you, I won't talk when I play it because we only need to see a second. Okay, but I was talking about on the YouTube. There's a volume control on the YouTube. So that's probably yeah, right cranked here. up. Yeah. Okay, sure, sure. Sorry, that was annoying. So you can see that there are lots of different topics on data is beautiful. It's just a really pretty way to, to introduce a lot of data all at once and make it very visual. They do have a lot of pop, um, they have a lot of pop ones too, like most popular websites, uh, most popular singer, things like that. Okay, and finally, sorry, can't help, you. Can't help the commercial here. That still works. Still works. Still works. This is a really In cool December YouTube 20 channel called, I can't say the German word, Kutzungsrocht, or In a Nutshell. And what they have is they have really quick, informative videos. According to Wikipedia, it's a German animation studio, although it's in English. The studio's YouTube channel focuses on minimalist animated educational content using the flat design style. It discusses scientific, technological, political, philosophical, and psychological subjects. They have a great video on the coronavirus. We'll just watch a couple seconds in so you can get a feel for how they take complex subjects and make it simple.
2019, the Chinese authorities notified the world that a virus was spreading through their communities. In the following months, it spread to other countries, with cases doubling within days. This virus is the severe acute respiratory syndrome-related coronavirus 2 that causes the disease called COVID-19 and that everyone simply calls coronavirus. What actually happens when it infects a human and what should we all do? A virus is really just a hull around genetic material and a few proteins, arguably not even a living thing. It can only make more of itself by entering a living cell. Corona may spread via surfaces, but it's still uncertain how long it can So you can just get a feel for how they take uh, complex subjects and kind of simplify it in a cartoony way. So it's a really great site. I love it. Or it's a great YouTube channel. Once again, it's called Curse... I can't pronounce it, but in a nutshell. What about if you're an ESL instructor? If you teach lower level ESL, I highly recommend MES English. Not only the YouTube channel, but the website, because you can create really quick worksheets on there. They already have the graphics for you. They also have an audio site, a focused listening site called 123 Listening. And let me give you a feel for what you can expect on their channel. Adjectives from MES English. Long, short, long, short. Clean, dirty. So they're pretty good for um, beginning ESL students. There's another, um, it's called Easy English. What kind of this world do you ESL want to live students? in? I want people to wear what they want. Welcome to Kids Pages. Improve your vocabulary and learn new English words about feelings and emotions. Happy. This family is happy. Sad. The little girl is sad because she can't play outside. Uh oh, sorry. It's supposed to. It's supposed to come up in here, but it keeps taking me to YouTube. All right. No big deal. And am I back at Easy English? Let's see. Now, if you had. There we go. There's my easy English. For um, intermediate students and sometimes beginning, you could go to Mark Kulik. Don't anybody panic. <laughs> Can you all hear me? There we go. Yes, Stephanie. Sorry about that. It's Sorry okay. about that, everyone. Um, I'm going to suggest that you don't have so many YouTube um, tabs opened because that's okay. going to create uh, more and more bandwidth that you're using and it might kick you out of Zoom again. Okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share again, okay? Yes. <laughs> uh, Melinda, were you able to put the Padlet link in the chat? I believe Anthony was, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Another English channel that you can use, especially with intermediate, is Teacher Diane. She does really nice grammar explanations. 
Today we're going to learn about the past perfect tense. The past perfect tense is used to signify that an event happened before another event in the simple past. The formula is subject plus had plus past participle. Let's take a look at a few examples. Here we can write, she had not seen a kangaroo until she went to Australia. Here we use had not seen. That is uh, teacher Diane, whoops. And then there are so many advanced YouTube channels. I, I mean, um, one of them that I like is mm English. No, you hang up. All right. All right, all right, let's hang up on three. Hey there, I'm Emma from English. In this little video today, I'll be sharing some incredibly common English words. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of um, advanced. I was kind of hoping my little shapes had come up so that you could see the names, but they are on the, um, the names are all on the Padlet. Oh, there's teacher Diane, and there's mm English. And there are so many more. There are so many more available on YouTube. And one of the ways that you can make these videos a little bit more interactive and you can gauge whether or not your students are understanding the videos is by editing them with tools like Edpuzzle. I'm going to show you an, ex an example of an Edpuzzle that I created. I just want to see how many tabs I have open now. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you an example of an Edpuzzle that I created, and you can see how it's possible to add, you can add audio commentary, text commentary, or comprehension questions. have a different meaning than the original verb. Maria and I really get along well. Hurry up and finish your work. Time is running out. We were going to have a meeting yesterday, but we had to put it off. Come across, get along, run out, and put off are all examples of phrasal verbs. What's a phrasal verb? A phrasal verb is a combination of words, a verb plus a particle, that, when used together, have a different meaning than the original verb. The particle can be a preposition or an adverb. Let's take another look at the examples. While I was cleaning, I came across an old picture of you. What do you think came across So here means? the video is paused and your student needs to answer the question. I've already selected find by chance. And then I'll click continue. What do you think get along means? So your student would see this question. What do you think get along means? What do you think run out means? Okay, so you get, the, you get the feeling for how this works, and it's very easy to do. You create an Edpuzzle account, you find a YouTube video that you'd like to use. I used a video that I created, but you can use any YouTube video. You submit the link, and then this video editing tool brings up your video, and you just select the places in the video where you would like to insert either a multiple choice question, an audio comment or a video comment. Once again, that's called Edpuzzle. It's very easy to use. Now, that brings us to another type of tool that you might want to explore. If you'd like to create your own video, a great tool that I recommend is Screencastify. Screencastify is an extension that you add to Chrome. I'm going to um, Hold on, my pop-up box is over here. Can you see where my arrow is pointing? 
Not so much. If you look in the upper right hand corner of my browser, do you see a little orange arrow? There it is. Above the word share. That is Screencastify and it is a screencasting tool that you add to your Chrome extension. It's free or if you really want to do a lot with it, you can pay $24 a year, which is what I do because I use it almost every day. And I use it to provide feedback for my online students. Here's an example. I am with my family. I always have. Hi, Lucia. Let's take a look at the sentences for module eight. When I am with my family, I always have comfort food, not a uh, because food is a non count noun. Nice use of a comma there. San Diego has so desolate streets. I actually streets. use it to yes, provide feedback, is. but I also use it when I want to film, if I want to narrate a Google slideshow or a PowerPoint. And another tool that you can use is Zoom. When you create your Zoom account, you also get a, a Screencastify tool. And uh, it's really nice to use. You can, you can actually, like, it's got annotation tools, so you can annotate if you'd like to. The Screencastify and Zoom are really good for recording your screen. But if you'd like to try your hand at actually creating video, you can create fun videos on Powtoons. My phrasal verb video was created using Powtoons. And there's also a really fun tool called Biteable, which is similar to Powtoons. And it's really easy. You just click and drag scenes and create your own video about any topic that you want. Let's move on to some tools that you can use to practice vocabulary. I believe probably everybody is already familiar with Quizlet. And I use Quizlet quite a bit in my online class. There's also a tool called Study Stack, which is similar to Quizlet. It has a few more features in terms of playing games. And one of the nice thing about Study Stack is that when students initially look at the flashcards, they can tap on them to say, yes, I know them, or no, I don't know them. The words that they already know are placed in a folder, and they're not put in with the other words while they play their games to study each vocabulary word. So it sort of saves students from redundancy. What about class competition and fun? We mentioned earlier that some of the learning will take place sync, um, synchronous, there will be synchronous, also asynchronous, but you want your students to see one another while they're online. Tools to help them do that are Kahoot. You can assign a Kahoot as a homework, and one that I especially like, which is quizzes. I'm going to show you how quizzes looks from the student's perspective. attention that little avatar that runs across the top that means time is running out so the student sees his little avatar running toward the end and he knows or she knows that time is running out
Now, I don't know why, but students love those little memes. They just get such a kick out of them. I don't know why. That's how the student sees quizzes. Now, while this student, William, was playing, you only saw one name, but your students will see everybody else who's taken the quiz before or after. You assign it for homework and it just stays there until you're ready for it to expire. So they get to see a whole leaderboard and they can see where they fall in. One of the tricky things about um, remote learning, we'll, we'll, tr we'll be trying to hold discussions with your students. So one tool I'd like to introduce is Flipgrid. Here's how it looks. We often get asked how we use Flipgrid in a classroom. So I'm just gonna show you a couple examples real quick. One way was we posted four story problems, um, real world problems, and we ask kids to um, show a bar. This little green button up here with the plus, that is where students click and then they can audio tape themselves or they can just, um, they can tape video or audio. our model and how to solve the problem and then post it on Flipgrid so that classmates could um, see how to solve the problem. So here's an example. Tom has 12 baseball cards and 11 football cards. How many cards does he have in all? This is Jonah to explain how to draw a bar model. So first you um, draw a rectangle and then you draw one line and then, so whatever the story problem is, you put the first one to the left and the last and the other one to, to the right and, so, and you draw the, and you, um, and you draw the letters that say what the characters or subject is and the box is right here. And then, you come down here and you draw a kind of loop here and a loop here and then you have to um, draw, draw the um, answer in the bottom and then put a, first you put a question mark and then you write the answer in here. And then this is the plus. So 12 plus 11 equals 23. Okay, so what happens is One the example. student has about 90 seconds to record either an audio or a video response. And what students see as more and more people, um, as more and more people record their responses is a wall of faces. As a teacher, the, um, by the way, Flipgrid is completely free. I believe that Microsoft bought it so that teachers can use it for free forever. It's free and you create a topic, which is whatever you want to talk about, and you might ask your students a leading question and they can respond. And your students can see one another's response and post replies. It's a really fun tool, but I have to caution that it isn't it's a little tricky to get students started with because they'll have to download an app on their phone and sign in with their Google account. So if you want to use this tool, I recommend that you practice while you are holding a synchronous video conference first before you expect students to be able to use it on their own. It's a little bit tricky to get students started on. Another great discussion tool is Padlet. As you know, we're using Padlet, I'm using Padlet in this webinar to post all of the tools and video channels that I'm talking about during this webinar. But you can use it in creative ways, in different ways with your students.
Padlet is a free online virtual bulletin board that allows students to collaborate, reflect, share links, pictures, and information, and more. Here are 10 classroom uses for Padlet. Number one, Padlet is a great tool for brainstorming and sharing ideas. Students in a class or group can contribute their ideas to one central online location. The brainstorming Padlet can then be saved and revisited later. Number two, Padlet can also be used to conduct surveys and votes. Using the reactions functionality, teachers can post several options, then have students like or upvote the ones they wish to choose. Number three, because Padlet gets updated in real time, it's a great way to collect and communicate class or school announcements. Just share the link with the class or on school social media and everyone's informed. Number four, for independent reading, students can use Padlet to highlight quotes, discuss characters, ask questions, review books, and more. Number five, Padlet allows teachers and students to summarize a topic and present the information in an attractive way using text, photos, graphs, and other learning tools. Number six, Padlet is a great way to celebrate birthdays and say thank you to speakers. Just create and design a Padlet and have students post their well wishes or thank yous. Number seven, if paper graphic organizers have gotten stale, Padlet can liven them up. Main idea and details, Freyer models, Venn diagrams, all can be converted into collaborative Padlets. Number eight, Padlet is a great platform for competitions such as photo contests. Students post photos and other students evaluate the photos to determine a winner. Number nine, students and groups can access their own Padlet to collaboratively create paperless multimedia posters that can then be presented to the class. Number 10, Padlet provides an effective platform for students to build portfolios of their work. No need to keep a folder, just post portfolio contents as they are created. There are many more ways to use Padlet. For ideas, check out the Padlet Gallery at padlet.com slash about. I really love gallery. Padlet. I used it one time. My students recorded podcasts, and we used Padlet to share our podcasts with one another. That's a really fun tool to use, perhaps, as a discussion board. And what about assessment? How are you going to assess your students online? Well, one great tool is Google Forms. I'm so sorry. The most common reaction to a birch arrangement is, I didn't know flowers could look like this. I'm Hi there, Jamie Keith here tonight at Teachers Tech. Hope everyone's having a fantastic night. Tonight I want to take a look at a new feature in Google Forms and that is the self-grading quiz on it. So this is a great little feature to have if you use things like Flubrew before. Uh, and now it's built into Google Forms. So let's go through and look at how you can use this great feature in the new Google Forms. So I'm just going to go ahead and open up a Google Forms here. So I'm just in my Google Drive, all logged in and everything, and I'm just going to go to New, More, and Google Forms. When I get to this point here, you'll see Google Forms in the standard purple template that uh, opens up. If you wanted to real quickly change the color uh, to something else, I'll just pick this bright color here. Uh, you could uh, then start from there. Where So this is all about the quizzes here. So when you want to switch this over to a quiz, we just click the gear up top and you can see that you get this quiz. This you didn't used to be here. So if I go to quizzes over here, all I have to do is click make this a quiz. So I'm going to go ahead and click it and you have a few different options here. So you can see uh, when I can release the grade, do I want to release it right after the submission? So that means when they click on it, when they submit it, uh, do they do you want to see the results or maybe you want to do something and uh, give the results after if that's the case you have it did instead uh, do you want to show them any missed questions that they have uh, make sure that's checked correct answers if you they got something wrong do you want to show them the correct answer on it and the point values to each so you can actually pick what point values you want for each questions so I'm just gonna leave all these on here uh, then I'll show you once I create my uh, little quiz here and grade it to show you how these kind of play into it so I'm just gonna go ahead and hit, uh, and hit save here I'll just give this a title on top of my quiz here I'll just go uh, I'll say test uh, test one I here. did link this 
this and, video uh, to our in... Padlet. So if you're interested in exploring a little bit about how to create self-grading quizzes using Google Forms, I encourage you to go to the Padlet and watch the full video. In the sake of, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna stop us here just to let you know that this tool is available. And the nice thing about Google Forms is it embeds really nicely on all of the various websites. You could post it on the Padlet. If you actually are using a learning management system like Canvas or Schoology, you could embed it there if you wanted to. Although I often, much more often, I use the quizzes in Canvas. That way I don't have to check two separate accounts. But I often use Google surveys, these forms to survey my students, even though I'm in Canvas. And another great assessment tool is, um, it's an online worksheet creator called Wiser Me. And I just love this tool. Wiser Me is free and you can create online, um, you could call them quizzes or just worksheets, and they have all kinds of different question types. There are several that are already created for you. I'm going to bring up one of my colleagues' worksheets to show you how it looks. It's really easy to create these worksheets. You just click and drag items. This is a job worksheet interview. And at first, students get some practice with vocabulary. Brian simply embedded a Quizlet into this particular worksheet. Next, students go on to watch a video and answer questions about the video. There are closed questions available. There are matching questions available. You can categorize. There are all types of different question op options. You'll notice this is a voice response. So the student records his response. They also have short text responses. It's very versatile and I think they're beautiful. This is a really easy tool to use. It's super easy to create your own worksheets. Um, you can add images, videos, whatever. It's super easy to, to create your own worksheets. You could do dictations if you wanted to, but they have a huge pool of worksheets that have already been created. So you could also simply search. It's free and it's a really cool tool called WiserMe. All right, well, let's review the objectives for our webinar, we wanted to identify best practices. And we went over the idea of organizing interactive content, synchronous and asynchronous learning. And then I showed you some examples of how to modify face-to-face -face content for remote learning. Another great tool for that was the one we just looked at, which is Wiser Me. We identified some really great tools you can use to provide some great remote instruction. And so at this point in the webinar, I think I'd like to stop sharing my screen and open it up to see if there are any questions. Does anyone have any questions? I'm sort of looking through the chat right now. There's a couple in the, uh, the Q&A coming up. Can you see that, Stephanie? Uh, uh huh. Interested okay. in knowing how we can track student work so I know who is engaged and who isn't asynchronously. That's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, you know, the best way to do that would be to use a learning management system. Like I can see how long my students spend online all the time. If you're not using a learning management system, then the best way to gauge whether or not your students are interacting with the content is to have content that they should actually submit to you or um, provide some sort of like quizzes, for example. You're, you will be able to see if your students completed the quizzes. The Ed Puzzle that I showed you, 
you would be able to see if the student completed the ed puzzle. So you will need to provide at least some assignments which require some sort of a submission, whether that's working on a Google Doc and submitting it to you, or doing some sort of a quiz or a Kahoot. Even Quizlet, if you have your students, if you create a class on Quizlet and you have your students, um, you invite your students to join your class, you can see that they've actually been working in Quizlet. Any of those tools would be really great to know if they're engaged and who isn't. Google Forms would be another one. When your student submits the Wiser Me results, you would be able to see whether the student has completed that work as well. And so now I'm interested in knowing how we can track, okay, so the next question, can you screen share these interactive quizzes and have students interact with them in the Zoom environment? Yes, yes you can, I've done that before. Where um, I have screen, I've screen casted, or I've shared my screen for the quiz and students interact, yes. And then somebody else wrote, good point that Quizlet has given us all teacher status till June. And then I have a question, how long does it take to feel comfortable using all these online tools? Uh, you feel a little bit shaky now. Oh, let me tell you, oh my gosh, the first year that I did online instruction was I think four years ago. And I have to tell you, I, I didn't know anything. I was so clueless. So my advice is to please be patient with yourself. Don't expect that you're gonna be up and running immediately, just go little by little and use some of the easier tools at first. For example, the Padlet. Those are very easy to create. It's really easy with your students to interact with them. Those are super easy. The Wiser Me worksheets are also very, very easy. I believe the trickiest part is finding the platform to share this content. And that's why I tried to give you a few high tech options like learning management systems and a few low tech options like Padlet. That's gonna be the tricky part. Um, but just be patient with yourself. I've been teaching online now, this is my fifth year. So you could say I've been, in, I've been a work in progress ever since I started online instruction. The teachers in our district, like so many others, many of them were face-to-face -face only. And right now they're scrambling to, to get stuff online. And I'm just, my advice is breathe easy and do the best you can. Ask yourself to learn or become familiar with one new tool a week. Give yourself this first week and use Wiser Me. That's one of the best tools and it's very, very easy to use. It's super intuitive. Um, I have a little bit of time. If I can get logged in quickly, I'll show you how easy it is to create a Wiser Me worksheet. Stephanie, while you're doing that, I'm going to answer one question here. Does someone have to host an LMS like Canvas or Moodle? Canvas is available free. All you have to do is to go to the Canvas site and you are hosted already. There is a Moodle option. You can have your own server. That takes a lot of work, a lot of time, and you need a server. You can also piggyback on somebody else's server. Yes, like OTAN. Um, but that takes some um, finagling. And right now, as far as I know, Anthony, please correct me if I'm wrong, it is only available at this point to WIOA funded agencies in California. Yeah, if we're talking about Moodle, um, I don't believe there's been a definitive answer on that question if we would be able to offer it to non WIOA agencies. So um, that still is a work in progress. And Melinda, can I just add one thing too? So there have been a number of questions about um, getting Stephanie's slides or links to the resources or what have you. So um, again, in the chat, I just posted a link to Stephanie's Padlet. And um, so on Stephanie's Padlet, she, all of the, or most or all of the tools that she spoke about this after, or, sorry, this morning are listed on the Padlet. So she has a lot of links and more information about the tools right on the Padlet. We'll also work on trying to get Stephanie's slides up on the OTAN website as soon as we can. But if you need to look again at the tools that Stephanie mentioned, and she has them very nicely organized as well, just go to her Padlet. And again, the link is in the chat. 
And regarding the Padlet, it will actually be more useful to you than the slides because I've also included the video tutorials that I showed throughout this webinar. So I think your best resource from this whole webinar would be the Padlet. Stephanie, there's one question in the chat that I think is important. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, most of our students don't have a computer or have very limited computer skills. How can you build students' confidence? You know, that's a really good question. And um, I have students who have very limited skills as well. And so the first thing I would emphasize is to start with simple assignments, things that students can complete easily. Um, things like, I think the Wiser Me pops up really nicely on a phone. And the way you would share the Wiser Me worksheet with your students is via email link. If you're not using like a learning management system or website, you could share it via an email link. The student would click on the link and he or she would, um, would enter her name and then the worksheet automatically pops up and you, you can use your phone to complete it. That's a really easy way. Another really easy thing to use on your phone is Padlet. And another suggestion I have is don't underestimate your students' children. Ask, ask your students to check in with their kids if they need help doing something. I once had this student who I had to telephone conference with the, with the 12 year old, his son, because the student couldn't understand the assignment or how to find it. The son found it in a heartbeat and was able to help his dad. So don't underestimate, and your kids, the, our students' kids are now home with them. So they are a great resource. Part of it too is just, as I mentioned, being patient with yourself and being patient with our students and offering them easy, intuitive, um, like Quizlet comes up on your phone super easy and that's really easy to work with from your phone. So instead of moving right into advanced assignments where they're typing Google Docs, start slowly and as their confidence builds, introduce a few more tools. And I saw a question regarding Wiser Me, can we upload a PDF? And the answer is no. There is a there is a site called liveworksheets.com in which you could upload the PDF and then work with text, box, text boxes to make it interactive. But I think Wiser Me is so much nicer. And it might mean retyping some of your tools, but the students, it's just so much, the interface is so much more beautiful. Is it okay if I share my screen for a second and just show you how quickly you can create one of those worksheets? So absolutely. Okay, I just got to move a couple of these Zoom boxes out of the way here. I am on my Wiser Me dashboard and I could either search all of this, I, I could search across their forum for a worksheet that I'd like. Like, let's say I want to do something with phrasal verbs. I could either select one of these worksheets and then copy it into my account and use it for my students if I liked it, or I can create a new worksheet by clicking Create Worksheet. And you know, they have these beautiful templates. Uh, you can choose the template that you like. And then it's just you add a question simply by clicking on it. Like let's say you wanted to add a multiple choice question. You click there. And then you show, uh, how do you want your students to respond? Do you want this to be uh, voice, video, or do you want it to be multiple choice down here? You can also record instructions like students please select the correct answer or whatever. So then you would just an enter your options down here, whoops. You could add another ans answer and then once you're finished, you could, you could click done. 
Now I understand the differentiate instruction is only available as a paid option. And I guess what that does is if the student answers it incorrectly, keeps bringing it up or something like that, I'm not exactly sure. But then you would click done and your select all the correct answers. Okay, let's say the correct answer is B. Done. So now you already have your first question. And the way you would, you, the review tab here along the top would show you what it's going to look like to students. To assign it to learners, once you click here, you get a link. That will be the link that you will send your students. And then where it says answers, once your students start submitting their work, if you click on answers, you'll be able to see your students' work and provide feedback. Your students have two options to receive feedback. If they enter their e-account when, um, when they type their name, it also gives them an option to enter their email account. If they do that, the moment you submit their, um, the moment you review their worksheet and click submit, they receive an automatic email telling them, your work has been reviewed, click here. And then they go back to the worksheet and they hear your comments. Or if they don't provide an email address, you will simply have to email them the link back to WiserMe. They'll sign back in and they'll see their feedback. I just think this is a great tool and um, I just feel like so few people know about it. Um, are there any other questions? How do we create a still photo or avatar for display on Zoom instead of live video? I think you do that in your profile. Yes, I think you, you can, yeah, you, you can upload a picture. So I think Marjorie over here took this um, flattering penguin photo and she just uploaded it into her Zoom profile. Somebody else mentioned Burlington English and that's a great way to know whether or not students are being engaged as well. So that's a great suggestion there too. And to piggyback on that, there's also another tool called USA Learns. Oh, yeah. uh, it also tracks and keeps, uh, you know whether or not your students have been online and using the course and it's free. So we'll and it's, a f it's full, it's got, it's got everything. I mean, it's got beginning, intermediate and advanced. Of course it's ESL. So not A-B-E-A-S-E, -E, but ESL. And it's a full course. I mean, you're, yeah. you could just offer your students that for this remote teaching and they would get a lot out of it. It's pretty high quality. It sells grades and, and yes, and you can track and, and do all kinds of stuff through there. Um, it looks like the questions are winding down. And USA Learns also has a citizenship component. Yes, uh, that was actually, um, it was <laughs> somebody assisted with that who is sitting in the room, but I'm not gonna kick her to the curb. Um, but it was ESL teachers and citizenship teachers helped create that, those courses as well. So we've got a couple of more questions in the, um, the Q&A, Stephanie. Oh, okay, what do we got there? How do you integrate wiser.me into an LMS like Schoology? I know that it integrates with Google Classroom. I don't know if it integrates with Schoology. It does not integrate to Canvas. And so what I do is I provide my students a link and they just click on the link and then they complete their wiser me and I have to step outside of canvas to grade their work but I find it's one of the only tools I'll, I'll do that with because I love it so much so the answer is it depends I know I'm pretty sure it it integrates with Google Classroom but I don't know about Schoology and it doesn't integrate with canvas okay how long is your online ESL class three hours Question oh, mark? that's a good question. Currently, I teach a six hour a week advanced online grammar. I did teach core classes when I first began teaching online. So it wasn't that students were necessarily online three hours a day, but they were expected to complete 15 hours of work per week. And in our district, we define the teacher sort of defines that. I don't know if you remember, but I took you to my Canvas course to show you how I organized it. And I mentioned that every module begins with an agenda. And on that agenda, you saw a time expectation. So the teacher kind of estimates how much time she thinks each assignment will take. My assignments, it is anticipated that they will take about six hours per week. When I was a core class, it was 15 hours. Now that doesn't mean that my students and I were together those 15 hours. We met online synchronously uh, one or two hours per week, 
And then they were expected to complete all of those other tasks outside of our meeting. That's how we gauged the time. So it will depend on your class. If your class meets face-to-face -face 12 hours per week, at least in my district, it's the expectation that you provide at least 12 hours of work. And part of that time will be, um, at our district, it is part of the time it is, uh, I don't want to say mandated, that's a heavy word. I, I mean to say it is highly suggested that you spend at least one or two hours, um, probably even more closer to three or four with your students video conferencing. And the rest of the time provide enough activities that you could justify, pretend you were going to get audited one day, you could justify, yes, my students had to complete this and this in my opinion is 12 hours of work. Um, I think I read that USA Learns requires a computer. I thought they had an app, don't they, Melinda? The app is uh, just a bunch of uh, different, it's, it's more of a tool, tools that the students can add to oh. their, their thing, but it is responsive design. So the, the USA Learns that is current has a responsive design built into it. So if they use a tablet or a phone, it will detect what it's on and then it will uh, resize itself accordingly. So yes, the old USA Learns, we, <laughs> we used to say, just use a computer, but now it's basically in a device. Um, so I think that answered the question. That is such a good tool to use. If you don't know where to start, USA Learns is a great place. Um, somebody else asked about Brain Pop. And thank you for bringing that up. I personally am not familiar with it, but any tools that people can suggest in the chat or the Q&A, certainly say check it out and then there's how do you integrate MES into Schoology so in other words I think you mean the YouTube channel and or the website or the listening site is one two three listening I'll type um, I can add them to my Padlet in just a moment but for now I will type them in, in the chat and um, we have another suggestion um, learning chocolate for low yeah. level yeah, I like that one. That one's really good. I don't know if you can technically integrate MES into Schoology, but what you can do is embed video. And then if you really wanted to get, you know, if you really wanted to get um, tricky, you could actually take the MES YouTube videos and create an Edpuzzle video where the video is stopped at certain sections and you can create questions or little comments. And then you, um, Edpuzzle integrates really well with most LMSs. I mean, I know they integrate with Canvas. I'm, I, mean, I think they do with Blackboard. I'm pretty sure they do with Google Classroom. I mean, it's a very popular uh, tool. So I think they integrate with a, with a lot. So when I use Edpuzzle in my Canvas class, it integrates. And so I don't, um, the, the grading happens right inside of Canvas. I don't even have to go out to the Edpuzzle site to do the grading. LMS is a learning management system such as Canvas, Moodle, Schoology, Edmodo, um, Google Classroom. And somebody else mentioned that Edpuzzle has great training videos. And don't forget, you know, YouTube is your best tutorial. Someone said, how long did it take you to get familiar? I think the best thing you can do is to learn how to ask the question. Because once you can learn how to ask the question, you get, you can find the answer. For example, if you understand that linking a video is different from embedding, then you'll know to ask the question, how do I link the video versus how do I embed? And you'll get more and more familiar with that as time goes on. Um, let's see. Stephanie, this is Anthony. Can I just make a suggestion because um, there seem to be a lot of questions about Schoology. So uh -huh. I actually, I have a Schoology account from way back when and so I logged back into it. And I noticed that when you log into your Schoology account, there's like a, um, a dashboard or sort of like a toolbar across the top of your account. And if you, uh, one of the one of the options in the toolbar is to click on what they call their app, app center. So I noticed when you click on app center, that seems to be the way to um, add some of these tools that you talked about today into your Schoology account. 
So I'm just looking at what's available in the Schoology App Center. And I see, for example, Edpuzzle is there, YouTube is there, um, Nearpod, uh, BrainPop is there, PBS Learning Media, Quizlet. So it may be that if you go ahead and create your Schoology account, then you can start playing around with some of these tools that you talked about today and some of the other ones and some others as well. And then that might be an easy way just to add one or two tools into your Schoology account and then create the connection that way. Yeah, yeah, those apps are um, in learning management systems. I know Canvas, we have, I would say, I don't know, almost 200 apps. I've only begun to explore them because there are so many. So once you're over this, this initial, oh my goodness, you know, everything has to happen at once crunch, Please just have some fun. Have some fun and explore what's there. That might not be until next summer, but until then, um, I certainly hope we've given you some ideas and tools that you can use immediately with your students and that will help you breathe a little easier. I, I realize that I've showed a whole bunch of tools very, very quickly, and I hope that I didn't confuse anybody. I hope that people actually felt like they've gotten at least one or two good tools out of the day. My takeaway, if you don't try anything else, try Wiser Me. It's very intuitive. It's, it's a lot of fun. And I think that's really it for me. Stephanie, thanks so much for your presentation. And I do, I'm not sure whether you mentioned this or not because I wasn't um, in, in, the, in the first couple of minutes, but for all, for everyone, I think for any of these tools that Stephanie talked about today or anything that you're practicing with out there, um, it's a, I, I found it to be super helpful to create two accounts. So one account is my teacher account that I'm using to create whatever I'm creating. But then I'm creating a second account with a different email address that I use as my student account. And so with two accounts, that gives me the, the opportunity to practice as a student what I'm creating as a teacher. So before you unleash this on your students, you actually have the opportunity to create, um, you know, do, do some, create some things and then practice them as a student. And then also you can practice them on your phone as a student or on a tablet or whatever devices you have at home. It's really important to understand what our students or how our students are seeing what we're creating. And as students, are we actually able to do the things that you're creating? So if I, if, if I create a Padlet, for example, um, and I have a link, can I send it to myself as a student and then see the Padlet as a student? So it's, a, it's just a great practice for all of us to adopt so that we understand you know, how these things are actually working.